Some nights, like that fateful night on May 25th, 2012. I ended my day early so I could really tie one on and celebrate because look at me, look at me. I made it. I did everything the world told me to do. Before 30 years old, I achieved what most could never achieve in a lifetime. But why was I so empty and broken and sad on the inside? Didn't I do it right? Didn't I follow the world's playbook so perfectly? It was May 25th, 2012. I was seven months into my journey as a first time founder CEO, and I had finished a record month. So I did what most 28 year old CEOs would do. I got ahead of my Memorial Day weekend with a night of drinking and partying. And when I was ready to call it a night, I got in my BMW convertible, and then I rang my neighbor's doorbell with my car. And I went to jail, where I sat with a concussion and a blood alcohol level nearly three times the legal limit and a weight of shame I had never felt. I then completed seven months of therapy, healing, and sobriety, yet I still didn't know how to move forward. It was 6 a.m. on Christmas Day, 2012. I was sitting in a village inn. Emotionally and mentally, I was spent. There was nothing left. I drove to my friend's apartment. I sat outside his door in seven degree weather and I texted him, hey, what you doing? Thankfully, after just a few minutes of an awkward exchange, he figured out I was outside. He let me in. We spent two hours together. He preached into my heart and he prayed over my life. And that day I began to feverishly read the Bible and I gave my life to Christ. And in that moment, I felt changed immediately. The guilt and shame disappeared. The weight was lifted and my heart swelled up and I knew my life was going to be different. <sighs> but how? I was an executive, a CEO, high powered, high urgency, type A, high income earner. How would I allow my heart to be on fire for Jesus, but also crush my goals? How would I stand firm and be a changed woman when so many people knew me for my competitive, steamrolling and relentless pursuit of winning? These two ladders represent my faith and the world. Up until Christmas Day 2012, I only ever knew this ladder. <laughs> In fact, I met this ladder at 22 years old and I thought this ladder was going to save my life. You see, I was raised in Northwest Indiana by an alcoholic mother and abusive father. On the outside, they seemed successful. My dad was an actor, an opera singer, appearing in several movies and shows. My mom was a classical pianist and choral director. The two owned a small business, a performing arts school, but their demons were greater than their talents and everything came crashing down when I was 14. They lost everything. And we lost everything in an auction held in a massive red and white tent in our backyard. We fled Indiana to Boulder, Colorado. I worked multiple part-time jobs and I danced my way through high school with straight A's and somehow survived it. But then, on April 24th, 2002, I was involved in a debilitating car accident caused by my 
careless driving. And it stripped my future away from me. No more dancing, no more future. And with no future and no direction, I entered the four darkest years of my life. I suffered from my own alcoholism, drugs, an abusive ex-marriage and questionable job professions. I should have been dead or in jail, but God had a different plan. Although I didn't know him yet. Then at 22 years old, I read an ad in a newspaper about an entry level administrative role for a Fortune 1000 payroll company, just 4.3 miles from my house against their better judgment, they hired me. That sales manager saw something in me I had never seen in myself. Within days, I had a premonition this job was going to change my life, and it did. I was in a sales support role, pushing paperwork, and one day, some of those papers caught my eye. They were commission reports. A salesperson on my team was about to receive a paycheck that was more than my entire annual salary. And I asked my manager, how do I get that job? We assembled an 18 month training and development plan. I achieved everything on that plan, including getting my associate's degree. I was offered the mid-market sales role and I became the number one rep in 30 days. My quota that year was $150,000. I sold $758,000, more than number two and three combined. This ladder of the world sure delivered on its promises, making me feel so special and accomplished and worthy. And it was addicting to climb it. And after five years of success, I left and took a VP of sales and marketing position. And in seven months, alongside the small executive team. We quadrupled the size of the company. I fell in love with that type of work and I started my first company. At 28 years old, I was a CEO. I had money in my pocket. I had a fire in my soul. I rammed my business quickly, although struggled with my ego. Some nights, like that fateful night on May 25th, 2012. I ended my day early so I could really tie one on and celebrate because look at me. Look at me. I made it. I did everything the world told me to do. Before 30 years old, I achieved what most could never achieve in a lifetime. But why was I so empty and broken and sad? on the inside. Didn't I do it right? Didn't I follow the world's playbook so perfectly? Why did the world let me take the hit and fall? Q God, he met me here and he picked me up and he brushed me off and he held me and he softly spoke to me and he loved me. He picked me up from the ground and led me to his ladder. This ladder looked different. It felt light and without burden. I didn't see any darkness or turmoil or conflict on this ladder. In fact, it looked washed clean and white as snow. I immersed myself in the word and soon the Lord brought me my husband on a blind date. My faith and new relationship became my focus and my business began to suffer. I closed that business and I didn't look back. I was all in with him and nothing of this world mattered. 
until I remembered I needed to make money. I was a talented salesperson and I knew I could reclaim my success. I got married and on the first day back from my honeymoon, I started again at the same payroll company and the same role I left. My two years since coming to Christ, he cleansed my soul from guilt and shame and washed me clean. He gave me a second chance at marriage with my new husband and he gave me my old job back. But could he trust me with it? I felt myself needing to come down to reality so I could focus again on my corporate sales role, but I felt split. But I felt good enough since I had equal focus on both him and my role. I conquered that role. I sold millions of dollars over a three-year period and even welcomed my son into the world. The sales success wasn't enough. I took a six-figure commission check and I started my second company and this one took off. I was a second-time founder, CEO, and the business was scaling. I was being recognized with awards and being named on lists. I was working hard and making money and breaking records and, 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 and. Something doesn't feel quite right. I had to choose, but the success, it felt so good. And Christ felt so good. Couldn't I have both? Couldn't I worship my job from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m.? Maybe 8 p.m., maybe 10 p.m., or always, and worship Christ. Why did God give me these marketplace talents if he didn't want me using them? Why was I experiencing so much inner conflict and doubt? Why didn't this feel so obvious at the time? Make a choice, Mary. I had to make a choice for my safety and my sanity. I had to make a choice. So what is the message here? Luke 11, 23 and Matthew 12, 30 say, anyone who is not with me is against me. Anyone who does not work with me works against me. You are for him or you are against him. That's it. It's black and white. There is no gray ladder up here. In this fallen world, God has given us the gift of choice, the freedom to choose. We honor Him when we choose Him. Sometimes, if you're like me, we're given that opportunity dozens of times per day, especially as an executive in corporate America, constantly tempted by everything of this world. We all need to choose Him And to do so, we must deny ourselves, die in our flesh, and rise in the Spirit. Matthew 16, 24 to 26 states, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I was faced with the decision to go all in with him. This looks like an easy decision, but it wasn't. The success felt too good, and I was a good salesperson, selling myself on the lie that I could effectively straddle these ladders. But I've learned that if we don't humble ourselves, He will humble us. And He humbled me.
It was December 13th, 2019, and I was sitting with my women CEO peer group, basking in all the glory of what I had built. My heart was full and my ego was swollen. I loved the Lord and gleefully accepted all his blessings. And I loved my business and I loved my employees. And I really loved how we scaled from zero to 1.55 million in two years without debt or investors. And I really loved that I made over $300,000 that year. I sat with these women and cried tears of joy, acknowledging all of my accomplishments and success. How sad. Because at home, my son didn't know me and my husband was raising him and taking care of the household in order to achieve that 1.55 million. I traveled at least three times per month and worked 100 hour work weeks. That's not honoring to God or my family. The family God gifted me. And just like the car accident on May 25th, 2012, God had another wake up call planned for me. He called it COVID-19. And starting March 17th, 2020, I entered into the worst three days. My business came crashing down and I dove all in to save it. For three days, I barely slept and I worked around the clock to navigate the relentless stream of client cancellations and uncertainty. I cried like I hadn't cried in years. I grieved a loss I couldn't put into words. I thought I had lost everything. And I sat on my knees in my living room devastated, eyes swollen with tears. And I looked over at my son, three years old. As the light from the TV screen illuminated his face, because I didn't even recognize him. And I looked up and I saw my husband and I saw a saint a selfless man who supported his wife's dreams and he never complained. And I felt sick because I sacrificed everything in my personal life in order to scale that company. And it came crashing down in three days. What a loss. I gave the world my heart and my talents and my time. And yet again, I was chewed up and I was spit out. And in my state of heartbreak, I knew where to turn. And I turned my palms up and prayed to the Lord on that floor to just take my company away. I had already lost more than 60% of it in three days and didn't think the bleeding would stop. I prayed he would just finish the job and take it from me. I felt ashamed for ignoring my family for two years and felt like I dishonored the Lord. But God didn't take it away. That Sunday, my pastor led a series called Unshakable. I was all in. I heard every word. The message was centered on Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Some of what I had built in my company was built with him. 
He revealed to me what was good and helped me understand that what fell off and was no longer was never meant to be. We were left with a scaled down version of the company, which allowed me to work less, sleep more, restore my health, create space for him, read the word, pray, spend time with my family, make breakfast, talk with them, rebuild the firm foundation of Christ in my life, counsel my employees and help them navigate the new normal with their families and their loved ones. And from here, I knew I never wanted to climb that dark black ladder of the world. (sighs) But I was still a talented corporate executive So how was I going to do this? Carefully. Let me introduce you to the scale framework. S, surrender. Let's take a moment and think about what we easily surrender to him and what we hold on to ourselves. It's as if I say to God, God, please take this burden, but don't worry about this one. I've got it. You tackle the ones I give to you and then I will handle these. What are the these in your life? Typically the these are what you fear the most. As stated before, you are for him or against him. There is no gray ladder. It's black and white. So how can we as Christians, Christians who love the Lord, hold on to anything? Because it's something deeply rooted in fear and we haven't given it to him. For me, It was money. He could have all my other conflicts and burdens, but it took a long time to surrender my finances to him. As a child who experienced poverty and then proved to myself, the harder I work, the more money I make. I built a belief system that as long as I go to work, I can always provide for myself, but that's not the truth. We all know the Lord can take that away in a heartbeat. Job 121 says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. What have you not given to him? C is for commit. Commit to the Lord, whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Proverbs 16, three, wise, wise words for a high urgency type, a professional like me. The scripture in my mind that comes before this is Proverbs three, five to six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will direct your paths. So that's the surrender part and wow. What a promise from God that he will build the path for me. But even better, if I commit in whatever I do, he will even make my plans for me. In James 2, 26, we read, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The context of this verse is found in James 2, 14 to 26. In these verses, James is rebuking those who claim to have faith in Christ, but don't show it by their good works. So work is good. I commit to the Lord. He establishes my plans, but it takes two of us to carry them out. Three, abide. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Where is their confusion? Abiding in Christ and obediently following his commands is an outward demonstration of my love for him. He tells me, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me you can do nothing. John 15, five, what a powerful message here. And 
a lesson I have learned as I live each day and work each day with Christ in me and guiding me, I will bear good fruit. L. Listen. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. John 16, 13. When I surrender all aspects of my life to Christ, commit to him in all that I do and abide in his commands, I create room for him in my mind and in my heart. And the Holy Spirit brings discernment to help me with my decision-making, which leads to my actions and yields results that are good and pleasing to Him. He will speak to me if I am listening. Ears to hear come from a quiet mind. And E, engage. My favorite step of all, the step that brings this all together, the step that honors who he is and who I was created to be, the step where I trust that all my work is good and my work is for him, the step that frees me from my inner conflict, misunderstanding to confusion about the calling and purpose in my life. This is the step that frees me from the enemy's lies as a talented, capable, successful, overachieving workplace professional. This is the step that confirms my work is good, meaningful, and full of purpose because the Lord proclaims that. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, Colossians 3.23. Why? Because Colossians 3.24 says, you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. It's that simple. In fact, that scripture convicted both me and my husband. And in 2022, we founded a Christian clothing and accessory company called Do Remarkable Work. I even adopted the tagline as my former company's motto. We had an illuminated neon sign in our entryway so every day, every employee could be reminded of the importance of our work and who we were doing it for. Surrender, commit, abide, listen, engage. Praise Him. Praise the Lord who created us in His image to honor Him and serve Him in this capacity in the marketplace. We get to further the kingdom. We get to save souls. We get to be the love and light, but only from this ladder. The ladder of the world has nothing to give except empty promises and immediate gratification that fades just in time for the addicted to chase their next high in titles, money, fame, and recognition. I followed this scale framework when the Lord gave me a second chance to rebuild my company. In 2021, we scaled to 5 million in revenue with 28 employees. And in 2023, I exited the business and stepped into a full-time chief revenue officer role with one of my former clients. I also turned 40. And looking back, the Lord gave me an opportunity to relive my 20s in my 30s. It is worth it to go all in with him. As a Christian in the workplace, you have experienced trials, judgment, hardship. You may have overcome these obstacles, but have you really taken the opportunity to go all in with him? I am here to invite you to take the first step toward that today. 
You can all experience heaven on earth. You can all be the love and light of Jesus in all workplace interactions. You can lead your colleagues to the word and to salvation. Please, everyone, let's go all in with him. Let's do remarkable work and let's be who we could have become.